Get your FNP-90s, Zat Nicotels, and Matak staff weapons ready as we're finally breaking down the primary uniforms of the SG teams seen throughout the sci-fi show, Stargate SG-1. Now, SG teams were primarily composed of U.S. Air Force personnel, but there were also U.S. Marines, U.S. Army, and Russian Ground Force teams. For the sake of time, though, we'll be focusing on just the more recognizable main uniforms, those being the off-world and Cheyenne Mountain Garrison ones, worn by the Air Force teams, saving some of the lesser seen or one-offs, along with the other branch uniforms for another video. So with those points hit, Premiering on Showtime Network in 1997, Stargate SG-1 continued the story laid out in the 1994 movie Stargate. The basic story is as follows. After the US government figures out how to use an extraplanetary portal known as the Stargate, the Air Force establishes the SGC, or Stargate Command, to oversee the exploration of various planets. Facing numerous opportunities and dangers, various four-person teams, designated by a basic ascending numeric order, were formed to explore, survey, and study the untold number of planets and what may reside within them. The primary frontline team, however, was SG-1, which was originally composed of Colonel, later Brigadier and then Major General Jack O'Neill, Captain, then Major, Lieutenant Colonel, and finally Colonel Samantha Carter, Dr. Daniel Jackson, and Teal, with other long-term members being Jonas Quinn, Fala Maldoran, and Lieutenant Colonel Cameron Mitchell appearing throughout the series as well. Being the main team throughout the show, they were seen wearing a variety of garrison as well as off-world uniforms. Now, it's important to establish that, as mentioned just before, we'll be focusing on the uniforms worn by SG teams composed either entirely or mostly of airmen. However, with that comes two styles. The first is the most recognizable, as it's the ensemble seen from episode one going through the entire show being used in just about every episode and is made from many unique and custom made pieces. The second is seen less often and is made up mostly of actual US military gear of the time. These are usually used by more offensive or support-based teams, such as Marine units, though are often seen on other specialty ones made up of airmen as well. For organizational purposes, we'll be referring to the first style as the frontline uniform and the second as the support uniform. That being said though, both styles are often used interchangeably by SG teams and sometimes items will mix and match, such as a vest mostly seen with frontline units being worn over a support uniform, or vice versa. But before we wrap up this intro, we want to acknowledge Stitches Loft, who partnered with us and helped extensively with the research, writing, and input on almost every level. Stitches Loft is essentially your one-stop shop for the most screen-accurate replicas of almost every piece you'd need to put these uniforms together, but more on them at the end. Finally, being that SG-1 ran for 10 seasons, a few of which ran alongside Stargate Atlantis, it's important to note a lot of things prop and costume-wise changed or were adjusted over time. For example, many of the BDUs and actual uniforms were both made for production as well as bought. Additionally, things like the vests saw so many tweaks and differences between seasons, it'll make your head spin. So with that in mind, we'll be covering the more general and universal aspects of these pieces while lightly touching on the intricacies. Okay, so with that rather long intro, we can finally get to it. Let's start off simple with the Stargate Command Garrison uniforms, which were seen in between missions for on-duty and daily wear within the SGC. Due to the pants mostly overlapping with the off-world uniform, we'll first be focusing on the tops and the one-piece suits, as the pants themselves are a rather interesting situation. There were two main ones seen, a two-piece uniform as well as a one-piece coverall, which appeared in two colors, an olive green and a dark navy blue, which sometimes appeared to be an almost dark purple hue in some episodes due to studio lighting. Starting off with the two-piece uniform, both versions of the tops were modeled off the battle dress uniform, BDU for short, but saw them having only two chest pockets along with shoulder tabs and being made of 100% cotton ripstop. They also featured a patch on each arm. The right sleeve mostly saw the wearer's SG team emblem, but occasionally an SGC patch if they weren't affiliated with a team, while the left had the Earth or Project patch, also known as the Home symbol. We'll be covering these in greater detail in just a bit. It seems that certain SG teams also wore standard Woodland BDUs with either chestnut or black undershirts as garrison uniforms, though they are seen rather rarely. The second garrison uniform, really only worn a handful of times in earlier seasons of the show, came in the form of an olive green coverall that had no insignia or identification. These were sometimes spotted in the SGC or when SG team members went out in public while on duty. 
These pieces were US CVCs or Coveralls Combat Vehicle Crewmans. That brings us to the pants. As said just before, they are a rather interesting element of the uniform. Throughout the show, there were five main variations used for different purposes. We'll get to that in just a bit. But the colors were olive green, used for both garrison and off-world purposes, blue, which was for the alternative garrison uniform, US Woodland, three-color desert, and a solid black. So, looking at them from afar or just casually, you'd think that they'd just be standard BDU pants. Well, they do look that way, however, they were actually based off of older US Vietnam era jungle fatigue pants. Due to most of the show being filmed in standard definition, as well as things like drop holsters and wider angle shots, features are often obscured, which gives the pants the overall look of BDUs. However, upon closer inspection, as well as through various cast photos, it's clear that they were Vietnam era cut for the most part. If you take US Vietnam era jungle fatigue pants and line them up next to US BDUs, you'll see that there are a lot in common. For the sake of time, we'll point out two of the most significant, which are reinforced knees with the BDUs and, more noticeably, angled pocket flaps with the Vietnam fatigues. This can sometimes be overlooked or missed due to the pockets often wrapping around the leg and hiding the slope. However, the back pocket slopes are a bit more pronounced and easier to see as they aren't covered up most of the time. Since most of them were custom made by the production team based on Vietnam era specifications, finding accurate ones will be a near impossible feat without going to a tailor or vendor who specializes in them as these cuts were historically only seen in olive green. However, due to a number of other SG units, base personnel, and forces in general, surplus pieces were also used, which means you can get away with the BDU cut. Regardless of style or color though, just be sure to get a belt to hold them up. For every uniform, save the desert ones, standard US BDU belts were worn. Green for the green uniforms, as well as the woodland, and black for the blue garrison, and all black off-world one. The odd one out was the desert, which used a beige cotton web belt with a gold-colored roller buckle. With pants address, we can transition completely into off-world uniforms. Regardless of teams, their purpose, objectives, or missions, the wormholes they went through transported them throughout the galaxy and beyond to various terrains, resulting in the need for an assortment of uniforms that were both solid-colored and camouflage in nature. For the frontline uniforms, there were four primary ones seen. A solid olive drab general use uniform, the standard US Woodland, also known as M81 Woodland, for more dense foliage and forested terrains, the US three-color desert for desert and arid environments, and finally the occasionally seen black one, for more covert operations, which eventually became more heavily used when dealing with the Ori in seasons 9 and 10, as well as the movie Stargate the Ark of Truth. For the support uniforms, there appears to be only two, the standard woodland and the three-color desert. Starting off at the top, we have the headgear worn by various SG team members. One of the most common pieces seen is the US Pazgit helmet, which will either have a black cover for their olive drab and black uniforms, US Woodland for their Woodland, and Three Color Desert for the Desert ones. These were accompanied by the standard green elastic cat's eye band, named after the two glow vinyl tabs on the back, which was used around every style helmet cover. Oftentimes, these helmets have a pair of US SWDGs or sun, wind, and dust goggles around them as well. Now, in seasons 9 and 10, a second type of helmet was seen being worn primarily by Army SG teams, but also on one occasion by an Air Force team. Though they were usually worn under UCP helmet covers, judging from the shape you could tell that they were a newer design, that of either the Mitch or ACH. Both of these helmets look nearly identical to one another seeing very minor differences visually, with the main changes coming down to material composition. However, judging from the number of plastic replicas available out there, which were most likely sourced for the show, chances are the ones used were Mitch 2000s. Whatever the case, these helmets were black and removed the need for covers for them, though they did include specific dual-lens bug-eye style goggles, which were seen worn over them. Moving on from helmets though, two other standard issue pieces frequently seen on the heads of SG members were US boonie hats and patrol caps. Unlike the helmet colors, these all match their respected uniforms, so olive for olive, black for black, and so on. Though it is worth noting that black patrol caps were seen worn with the olive uniforms a few times during earlier seasons. Another one seen thrown into the mix on occasion with a few different uniforms, mainly the black one though, is a black knit watch style cap. Next up we have specialty pieces of which were tethered to Daniel Jackson and Jack O'Neill. First up is Daniel Jackson's assorted bandanas. Though he often sported a variety of headgear his go-to, that is when not in unknown or hostile locations, appeared to be various matching style bandanas worn over his 
his forehead. Jack O'Neill frequently supplemented his uniform with a specific style of baseball cap. Being that it wasn't military issue in real life or in the show, sourcing an accurate one is a little tricky as they were custom made by the now defunct Canadian company Merkley Headgear. There appeared to be a variety of them seen over the seasons, but they all boil down to two colors, black and an olive drab, which over time faded, giving it a top or brownish color. Luckily, exact replicas are offered by Stitch's Loft. Now, O'Neill is often seen wearing, be it on his face or around his neck, a form of mountaineering or glacier glasses. Over the seasons, multiple brands were utilized such as Bali, MEC, short for Mountain Equipment Co-op, and Keb. Exact models are very, very hard to come by as some were made exclusively for the show in very small quantities, but very similar models, through sites like eBay, can still be found but often sell for more than $350 US dollars. Moving down is the standard undershirt. They came in three variants, long and short sleeve, which were seen most of the time off-world and around the SGC, and tank tops, which were mostly associated with the desert uniform. These can be basic t-shirts or military-issued ones seen in three colors, a black, tannish brown called chestnut, and finally a tannish beige. Now for frontline uniforms, black was used with the olive, woodland, and the all black uniforms, while the chestnut and beige colors were worn with the desert, the later being seen really only in promotional and cast photos. However, things varied with the support as black was seen with the same, but chestnut was often spotted being worn with both woodland and desert for whatever reason. If you wanna go screen accurate, some brands used were Gildan, Calvin Klein, and MEC. Next up are the jackets, which saw a bit of different models and materials between seasons, styles, and units. Starting with the frontline uniforms, by and large the most commonly used jacket was the US Navy G8WEP, seen in the four primary variants mentioned earlier. These jackets were originally worn by aviators of the US Navy and Marine Corps during the 1960s. Due to them primarily being made of a green satin, they gave off a bright sheen, which made them very noticeable. In the pilot episode of the show titled Children of the Gods, original surplus ones were used that only saw the addition of two Velcro circles on both arms for patches, which we'll get to in just a second. Once the show is picked up, these surplus ones were done away with in favor of a custom-made 100% cotton ripstop version, which was seen in the four standard uniform variations. Originals, be they surplus or screen used, can go for quite a large sum, but there are reproductions out there. However, if you want to go accurate to the show, it'll be a little tougher since they were specially made items. Now, in regards to the desert off-world jacket, up through season four, another flight jacket was used, the US MA-1. These can be sourced online, though finding the desert pattern is a little tricky as they're more frequently seen in solid colors such as green and black. While still on desert jackets, it's important to note that they were sometimes omitted entirely in favor of users simply wearing their chestnut undershirt and vest, though later on in the show the same was seen with other style uniforms such as the standard and black ones. For support uniforms, the go-tos were very straightforward as they were seen in only two versions, standard ripstop US Woodland BDUs and three-colored desert DCUs. However, it's worth noting that both frontline and support units were occasionally spotted wearing Woodland M65 field jackets. Regardless of style or jacket, the patch orientation remained the same. Now, on to patches. For the first five seasons, Air Force SG teams wore just two one with their SG team number on the right and the home patch on the left. These patches have some minor differences depending on season and what the SG team was wearing. So let's start with SG team patches. Right out of the gate, no pun intended, the pilot episode featured a version often referred to simply as the pilot patch. This one differs in a few minor ways, such as the detail of the chevron and border, but the most obvious and telling is the actual number in the center, which is much wider and not filled in, but rather black, like the background of the patch. After this episode, these were occasionally seen, sometimes through continuity errors like this one, but for the most part, were replaced with the standard patch. The standard, as well, did see three iterations over the course of the show, as denoted by subtle changes in the chevron design. However, there was an interesting production decision that technically caused a fourth version to be often seen, but not usually noticed. As more teams appeared later on, a piece of black cloth with that team number embroidered onto it were cut out and placed over the original patch's number. This essentially saved the production time and money having to make multiple fully embroidered patches. This can be seen in certain episodes, as if you look closely, the chevrons appear somewhat different compared to fully embroidered ones. Whether you wanna go this route or not, just know that every version came in at about 4 inches or 10.16 centimeters and by the end of the show there were 25 known SG teams that were a mix of Air Force, Marine Corps, Army, 
and Russian units, as well as the Jaffa Infiltration Unit, which wore patches that just had X's on them. Staying on the same sleeve was the SGC patch. Much larger in design, these were put on the same location as team patches and were most commonly worn by members of Stargate Command being seen more frequently on flight suits. However, on occasion, members who weren't assigned an SG team participating in missions did wear them, such as Daniel and Teal'c for the first third of Season 9. Next up are the Earth, or Project Home Patch, sporting a small rendition of Earth surrounded by stars with a giant point of origin over all of it. Right around 3.63 inches, or about 9.2 centimeters, these, along with the SG team patches, were worn by all team members both on their off-world and garrison uniforms. A third SG team patch was introduced right around the halfway point of the series, for a rather interesting reason. The story goes that since Season 5 leaned heavily into Area 51 mythos by making it a central part of the storyline, the U.S. Air Force, which had been advising and assisting on the show, got a tad annoyed. So, to appease them, a simple solution was found, slapping a 2.63 inch or 5.08 centimeter black circle patch with the Air Force's then new logo below the SG team patch on the right side sleeve, which remained there for all Air Force SG teams from Season 6 onwards. These became known as the Wing Badge, however because of the whole situation surrounding them, they also gained the nickname of the Area 51 Apology Patch, or A51AP for short. From there on out, the Air Force was happy as their logo could be seen in almost every episode. These patches are very easy to find, all over, be it websites like Amazon, Etsy, and eBay, at conventions, and numerous other outlets. However, finding truly accurate replicas is another story. eBay seems to have flooded the market with both green and tan subdued versions. However, they are just fan-made pieces, as every SG team uniform that had patches used the standard black versions. Additionally, things like the overall quality, sizing, and designs vary greatly, so when searching for ones, you really want to scrutinize them. Now, footwear is kind of a tricky thing to see, as most of the boots were all black and often not filmed in too many shots. However, they fall into two categories, military issue or inspired, and Magnum brand. Let's start with the latter, as they were the most prevalent. For a majority of the show, seasons 1 through 8, most SG teams wore the Magnum 8-inch Response 1 boots. However, for the last two, Magnum Stealth 1s were used. But in addition to this, Magnum Classics were also utilized. Although the model designation stayed the same, that didn't mean the overall appearance did. On occasion, you can see the tags on the front of the boot tongues will differ. Though these two particular models have been discontinued, finding a quality used pair is possible with some digging on secondhand clothing sites, eBay, or forums. Alternatively, you can also get the current iteration, which is just a tad different. Regarding military issue boots, they were seen in two instances, sometimes being worn with the garrison uniform, and as boots to go along with the desert off-world uniforms. Sometimes seen around the SGC were what appeared to be a pair of black leather combat boots, specifically the ones issued throughout the US military from the 1980s all the way through 2004 or so, which were identified as boots, combat, mildew, and water-resistant direct molded sole. As for their desert uniforms, a set of tan boots were worn. These were Ultima Model 5850s, which were essentially desert versions of the standard US Vietnam era jungle boots first seen in the 1960s. If you can't find Ultima brand, there are others with the same design, such as McRae and Rothko. Next up are vests, perhaps one of the most complex components of the uniform. These saw the most variations, modifications, and just general differences as far as users and accessories go. For the four frontline uniform variations, there were two primary vests, a black for the standard green, woodland, and black, and a tan for the desert. Being that there were so many differences between vests depending on users, episodes, and seasons, let's tackle the primarily ones seen throughout the show first, and then touch on specialty ones after. The vest that served as the base for the primary ones were the Eagle Industries slash Blackhawk Omega Medic slash Utility Tack Vest, but it's a bit more specific than that as there were actually three generations of these vests that saw subtle snap and velcro differences among them. What makes these vests a bit intimidating and a tad hard to source as far as the right versions is the history associated with Blackhawk and Eagle Industries. Originally they were owned by the same parent company and so there was some crossover as far as items go. However, the two then separated but then again both came under ownership of ATK come 2010, so the history of them is a little disorganized to say the least. That all being said though, the holy grail of Stargate pieces are Blackhawk models that carry the number 08 on the tag. These were essentially the original models used as a basis for many of the seasons. Since the show started, a few things changed with the vests, as a number of generations of them have been released, seeing subtle changes to them. 
For the sake of costuming versions, up to the fourth generation requires minor tweaks and adjustments. Between these and modifications done by the production over the 10 year run, trying to even attempt to chronicle everything could drive one to near insanity. These are still technically made by Blackhawk, as well as many other lookalikes by a variety of other brands, though they see a few differences. If you can't find any versions that were used by the show, these newer vests can be modified, though they are a bit extensive. However, Stitches Loft offers a service to convert newer or already purchased ones. Now, seeing all these vests with numerous pouches, pockets, and so on, you'd think that a lot of equipment was stored in them, and you'd be right. Uh, sort of. Episode to episode, team members are seen using a variety of gear and equipment. We'll be covering that towards the end. However, for the sake of the vest though, only two things seem to be constant. A radio and magazines for their primary firearm, the FNP-90. In later seasons, that is. The wearer's left pocket was used to store their primary form of communication, a radio. For a majority of the show, it was a Motorola VZR with short antenna. However, towards the end, the Motorola CLS-1100 was also used. A small hole was cut in some vests to allow for the antenna to stick through, while in later seasons a square-shaped cut was made along the end, giving it a more proper look. Certain episodes see the team members simply click the pouch to use the radio, while others show a clear coiled earpiece either wrapped around the pouch or actually worn in their ear. Regarding the P90 magazines, you'll often see SG-1 pull them out from inside their vests, which was done as the magazines themselves were actually too large to fit anywhere else. So the idea was that an imaginary pocket was there, which stored them. Inside there technically are places one could place them, but even then, they don't really fit and are kind of awkward. The desert versions of these used the same overall look and design, but were not made by Blackhawk. Instead, they were custom made by the art department. This has led them to be one of the hardest pieces when making a desert off-world uniform. Stitches Loft is probably the only place you'll be able to source them, though it may be a little bit as they're still ironing out a few kinks. Finally, the last element was that of a multi-strap chest and wrap harness for the P90. If you want to be screen accurate, it will have to be integrated right into the vest. For this, this, again look to Stitches Loft who offers the integration service. Moving to support uniform vests, these were far simpler as they were US military surplus vest tactical load bearing enhanced, often referred to simply as LBV or load bearing vest. These were also sometimes worn over US woodland pasget vests as well, but most often were worn right over standard BDUs. For the desert uniforms, they appeared to have worn the same vests as seen on the frontline uniforms. Now, attached to these vests were a number of items. Starting with the frontline Omega vests, a standard US nylon LC2 style pistol belt with the fast X style buckle was seen. They obviously matched the vests and had a few drop leg holsters and pouches attached to them. These belts are very easy to source, either as surplus or commercial copies. The drop items, though, are a little tougher. The primary holster seen was the Blackhawk Omega 6 Assault Drop Holster, specifically the Model 40QD40BK, to secure SG team members' primary sidearm, the M9 Beretta 92. Much like many of the other components of their uniforms, these saw slight changes over the years, such as certain ones seeing two securing straps, while others saw only one. Additionally, minor things like the inclusion of retention straps, Velcro pieces, and so on. Now, at some point during the show, the introduction of holsters for the Guauld sidearm, the Zat Nicotel, or Zat for short, was also added. Much like the Beretta holsters, they were drop leg and connected to the pistol belt. They came in two styles, an open face and a closed one. Both were obviously made specially for the show, but screen accurate replicas are available by a few sellers. In regards to the desert uniform, holsters for the Beretta and Zat guns were designed and created by the costuming department, so once again getting a hold of them will be a bit tricky. On the other leg, units frequently wore a drop magazine pouch system of some sort. The most widely issued was a triple cell magazine drop pouch, which was the Blackhawk Omega SMG model 56 SM40 BK. These were seen in earlier seasons as they were eventually dropped when the P90s became the primary firearm of SG teams. Other types can also be briefly glimpsed in certain episodes, which were likely connected to the type of firearm SG team members were equipped with. It's also a good guess that they too were Blackhawk brand and may have been slightly customized for shooting. These appeared to be omitted entirely from the desert uniforms, however. Additionally, between one and two LC2 canteens and their covers were worn along with M9 bayonets, which were the standard issue blades for most SG personnel, all of which matched the belts respectfully. A quick side note, bayonets and knives did see a few differences in regards to SG-1 and what uniforms they wore. 
For the most part, O'Neill was often seen wearing an olive drab Frobus M9 bayonet which had a pistol magazine pouch mounted to its front. The rest of SG-1 would either have the standard M9 bayonet, however, Teal'c and Carter were also observed on occasion carrying the Ontario Mark III, while Jackson sometimes had an Ontario SP-1-95. Moving to the support uniforms, their belts were the same LC-2 pistol ones as with the front line, but in green, and saw quite a few pouches and items attached to them, which appears to vary from episode to episode and unit to unit. Such items included an olive Bianchi M12 pistol holster, two LC2 canteens and covers, and an M40 gas mask bag, with the occasionally seen olive M9 bayonet and a woodland training field pack. Now that we got through gear, we can touch on the primary firearms of SG teams. Let's start off with the main ones used. For the first three seasons or so, the go-to firearm was the HK MP5A. A semi-compact submachine gun, this filled the need of SG teams who were on the move while not hindering them by carrying long-barreled service rifles such as the M4 whilst exploring various terrains and environments. Nearly halfway through Season 4, the FNP-90, a very recognizable compact submachine gun with a unique, almost futuristic design, was introduced with Jack O'Neill, even mentioning how its 5.7 by 28 mm NATO caliber rounds had better penetration than the MP5's 9 mm. From there on out, it became the standard issue weapons of most SG teams and became synonymous with the show. Now, there appeared to be a few reasons these were picked up both in-universe as well as for production purposes. In-universe, as just mentioned, was their overall power, however they were also selected because of their lightweight and compact design along with high rate of fire. Additionally, their smaller design and easy to connect system allowed for a much better user experience. On the production side of things, they looked futuristic and high tech. Additionally, they were ambidextrous, meaning left and right handed users didn't have a problem using them. Perhaps the most significant though was that they ejected spent casings downwards, which proved useful when filming as actors and crew didn't have to worry as much about being hit by them. Now, being that different SG teams were tasked with different objectives, such as exploration, research, scouting, combat, medical, and so on, other service weapons were also seen. These included, but were not limited to, the USAS-12 assault shotgun, XM-177 assault rifle, the M4A1, the Daewoo K3, which may have been used as a substitute for the SAW M249, the HKG36K and KE, the SPAS-12 shotgun, and the M60 E3 machine gun. Additionally, there was the Micro-16 assault rifle, also known unofficially as the Carter Special. This rifle is seen only in Season 7 being used only by Samantha Carter in a handful of episodes. It was perhaps one of the most interesting not only due to it being a customized Olympic Arms K23B, a compact AR style rifle, but also because of the reason it was made from a production standpoint, which was to sort of circumvent the elevated prices of P90 rounds at the time, due in part to the Iraq War, which had then just recently begun. Now the HK MP5A3s and the FNP90s are relatively easy to find in airsoft and replica form. As far as the remaining ones, some are easier to source than others, but can mostly be located through the same outlets as well. On the other side of primary weaponry was that of Gua'uld and other alien technology in the form of Matak staffs, known better as Jaffa staffs, which were used frequently by Teal'c for a time, as well as SG members on occasion, and the Transphase Eradication Rod, or TER, introduced by the Tok'ra. Since these were designed and made for the show as opposed to real-world weapons, acquiring them is going to be a bit of a challenge. For the staffs, there are a number of ways you can go, such as 3D printed, wood and foam, or custom-made ones on sites like Etsy or occasionally the RPF. Just keep in mind that most of the ones out there will be static, non-moving ones, with others that have lights, effects, and motorized parts being few and far between due to the required work. Regarding the TER, the Tok'ra weapon, used against the Ritu and later the Kull Warriors, they will be a bit harder to get since they weren't used as frequently in the show, and as a result, not too many people have made or sold replicas. Aside from all this heavy firepower were the sidearms, of which there were pretty much two primary ones, the M9 Beretta 92FS and the Gua'uld Zat. Airsoft and replicas for the M9 are pretty easy to find online, but the Zats will require a little bit of work. The production used three versions of Zats, a static closed, a static open, and a hero one that could go from closed to open. Depending on which you want to go with will really dictate price and availability, with the non-moving closed and open ones being the easiest to source or make through the traditional means, while the hero movable ones will cost a little bit more and require a bit more of looking around. People have made kits and fully finished moving ones, though you'll 
still have to do some legwork to source one. Moving on, we find ourselves on the topic of backpacks, which is perhaps the area with the most variation as the types used were heavily dependent on the operation, environment, and unit using it. By and large, the most commonly used one was the Blackhawk Omega Streamline Load-Bearing Pack Model 60 SLBPBK, which was always seen with the frontline uniforms. These were smaller packs that, through a slight modification, simply clipped onto the standard vests. Depending on episodes, different things would be attached, with some episodes having nothing at all. Frequently seen on the wearer's left side were two LC2 M4 magazine pouches. They were likely Blackhawk brand ones that did not include the grenade hangers, so any type will do with that slight modification. On the upper right hand is a sort of lesser seen smaller mystery pouch, which was likely production made as it resembled a sort of cut down M4 magazine pouch, but with a simple pull tab and presumably Velcro used to secure the flap. Below that was a single LC2 canteen and cover. On its lower front were two production made pouches that appear to be based somewhat on Blackhawk 541600BK M4 slash M16 pouches. These measured 32 by 12 by 4 centimeters or about 12.6 by 4.6 seven by 1.6 inches and were closed by basic plastic quick release buckles. Now, these packs have long been discontinued. However, Eagle Industries did make the exact same pack with two slight differences. A little pouch at the top right below the handle meant to hold a length of paracord was removed and the webbing seen on them was slightly different. The support uniforms on the other hand saw quite a variety of packs throughout the seasons. In fact, SG-1 and other teams who were often seen wearing the frontline uniforms also wore some of them from time to time. Due to the wide assortment and some being seen only once, sometimes for only a few seconds, we'll be primarily focusing on the main ones seen, which were the US FPLIF, or Field Pack Large with Internal Frame. These seem to have been worn in the pilot episode, along with an Alice three-color pack cover, and were later sporadically seen being worn with other uniforms. And the Pack Patrol Combat, which itself was made as a supplementary piece for the FPLIF, but would also be worn for shorter or more fast-moving operations where there wasn't much need for excess gear. Moving to a much smaller piece of equipment were the numerous watch models seen throughout the show. Though various members often wore different unique watches, it seemed there were a few go-tos seen throughout the different seasons. For example, the Casio G-Shock DW8300-1VT was seen being worn by SG-1 from season 1 to 4. Then came the Sunto Vector Black with the compass bezel for the remainder of the show. This one may have replaced the Casio as apparently Richard Dean Anderson, who plays Colonel O'Neill, was fond of it and supposedly heard it was a popular watch among actual military personnel of the time. However, at the same time, the Sunto X3 HR Black Altitude was worn on occasion being used by both O'Neill and Carter, while the Sunto Vector X Black was worn by Cameron Mitchell for the last two seasons. On top of all this was also the occasionally seen MWC G10 Military Quartz. These appeared both off-world and around the SGC. Off-world, they were commonly worn by Daniel and O'Neill sporting black nylon bands and covers. As for while on base, they usually featured just green bands. And speaking of garrison watches, Carter was also seen wearing an Invicta Women's Pro Diver Model 8939 around the base from time to time as well. Finally, to round things off were a few odds and ends seen at different points and by different members, such as scopes and other smaller accoutrements, appearing sporadically depending on episode, but let's start with the more commonly seen or referenced pieces. One of these were black USGS-FRP-2 Nomex Flyers gloves. These were seen being worn by teams when wearing the black uniforms for stealth missions, but were more commonly worn by O'Neill, granted with their fingertips cut off right above the knuckles. If you want to go the O'Neill route of fingerless, keep in mind that over time they will fray if they're not properly sewn or cinched. If you do try to singe, just know that Nomex doesn't burn easily, so it'll take a while. Though not seen very frequently on screen, perhaps the most famous was that of the GDO, short for Garage Door Opener, which was a device issued to every SG team member. This occasionally wrist-worn device essentially added an extra layer of security to Earth by sending a signal to Stargate Command, confirming the wearer's identity, resulting in the iris being opened to allow for their safe arrival. In the simplest terms, it was a basic keypad and LCD display held via elastic. SG-1 Props offers arguably the most screen-accurate one as it has light-up capabilities and is composed of many pieces cast from molds used by the actual production. Now, we would be remiss to not mention the dog tags, which are the standard issue ones still worn today, 
which have two tags connected by two chains and black rubber silencers on each one. Additionally, many SG teams carry the standard US M67 or baseball fragmentation grenades. Whew, all right. Here we go now. As mentioned with the vests, different items were seen in them and the packs episode to episode. Such items were but are not limited to sterno, slack duct and electrical tape, claymore mines, pens, flashbang grenades, which were actually just repainted M18 smoke grenades, actual M18 smoke grenades, black zip ties, MREs, hair dryers, rope, woodland ponchos and their liners, M40 gas masks with attached protective hoods, compasses, small black spiral bound notebooks, bandages, morphine and other first aid items, protein bars, power bars, safety glasses, blocks of C4, various types of flashlights, monoculars, binoculars, locator beacons for beaming up the ships for a short time, rectangular tactical mirrors, and bananas. Before we wrap up this video, let's quickly touch on some useful resources and groups. To learn more about costumes, props, gear, and really all things Stargate, you can check out GateWorld.net. On there, you can find all sorts of resources, forums, news, and really everything related to Stargate. Two other forum-based websites dedicated to Stargate props and costumes are SG-1 Props and SG Command. For physical sources, you can check out PropWorks' two catalogs, which were made for two separate auctions hosted in the early 2010s to sell off many SG-1 and Atlantis props, costumes, and set pieces. These for a long time have been considered the closest thing to a visual dictionary for the two series. Alchemy Arms is another great website that offers a variety of replica props and costumes from SG-1 and a number of other shows and movies. Finally is Stitch's Loft, which, as we mentioned at the start, helped in virtually every step of this video's production from the research and writing all the way down to the filming and editing. You can check out their website, YouTube channel, and social media. Links to all can be found in the description below. For years, they've offered top-tier reproductions of SG-1 gear, along with Atlantis and other costume and prop pieces, be they the vest, O'Neill's hat, pouches, straps, GDOs, and so on. Keep in mind, though, that if you plan to order from them or really any other website offering custom pieces, many of them have to be handmade, so they do take a bit of time to create and ship out. And that will do it for the Air Force uniforms seen throughout Stargate SG-1. Stargate started off as just another sci-fi movie back in 1994, but was quickly spun off into a TV show that helped create a franchise, spanning additional shows and media such as SGA, short for Stargate Atlantis, SGU, short for Stargate Universe, and Stargate Origins over the next 15 or so years. Though the show never quite got to the same level as other star franchises, it did garner a rather large and devoted following and remains a mainstay in the science fiction realm due to its unique blending of mythology, technology, aliens, modern military, and world politics. There's even a broom closet in the real-world Cheyenne Mountain Complex that says Stargate Command, so you know it's reverberated. Anyway though, as mentioned at the start of the video, down the line we'll be looking at the other uniforms such as the various alternate reality teams, Russian and US Army units, Marine Corps teams, and so on seen throughout the show. And maybe we'll dive into the ones worn in the original movie as well as those from Stargate Atlantis and Stargate Universe. Perhaps we'll even be able to cover new uniforms, be they Air Force, Space Force, or whatever other branch or group in the near future, as there have been rumors of a revival or sequel show as of late, thanks in part to Amazon acquiring MGM Studios. But hopefully this long-awaited and requested video proved to be entertaining and useful. Lastly, if you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like and maybe even subscribe. If not, no problem. Just be sure to check back soon for more uniforms of the screen right here on Uniform History.